And hey, everybody, welcome to Sterling Barrels and a little discussion today, a fun chat with one of our good friends, spirit professional, Daniel is with us. Hey, Dan, how you doing today, my man? I'm well, I'm uh, enjoying this subsidized vacation we're all uh, under right now. (laughs) That we all find ourselves in. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. no, it's a, it's definitely been an interesting time for for our community out there uh and, and for the spirits world so i hope you're doing well in all this and, and staying safe and healthy for sure not leaving the house much uh spring cleaning a lot <laughs> and uh yeah the, the wife is just putting me to work which she should so <laughs> good well that's awesome well thanks for taking a little bit of time to chat with us uh and, and myself um and uh to everybody out there today is a little gin chat uh it's a couple gin lovers uh coming together uh to talk of and celebrate uh, last week was actually uh national gin and tonic uh day so we're carrying over to that uh daniel and i actually met a few years back uh at the uh actually uh, before the gin joint even opened up at an event that uh you were with it was actually the uh, CW's uh, Gin Joint, uh, the International Gin and Tonic Day celebration. That was an awesome event. Uh, um, yeah, tell me a little bit more about your involvement there. Uh, that was when we announced to the public that we were like opening a business. So, what what day was that release in April? That day. Was- yeah, that was like April tenth, I think, three years ago. Yeah, okay, twenty seventeen. So, so in February. Um, <clears throat> Myself and Laura Moore were hired by Dean Hurst and Rory Martin. Dean Hurst was the uh, beverage consultant for the project, and Rory was the ops director. And Laura and I, since February, uh, had started working on the, the gin joint as a project. Originally, we were splitting time with uh, our current employers. So I was at Ulele, and Laura was still at the Epicurean. And uh, we were kind of like coming to, we would come to uh, Franklin Exchange Building before our shifts, work on stuff for a few hours, and then go to work, and then uh, got to the point where uh, Karen Wilson hired us full time, and we were just working on stuff like this. So we, uh, that specific day, again, we were announcing to the public what we were, and then we showed the gin matrix to the world, like a very reduced version of it. I, as you can see there, what is there, like eight, 12 gins on that? first matrix we ended up with about 55 so um what we did that day is we <clears throat> the four of us me myself dean rory laura represented like the four quadrants of the matrix if you will um juniper forward citrus forward floral and savory gins and we each were making gin and tonics with gins of our of our uh category we, we were representing so i was making citrusy gin and tonics i wore if you go through that article, there's a picture of me somewhere. I'm like, if anyone anyone watching this hasn't met me, I'm six seven. I was wearing like a fluorescent <laughs> highlighter orange suit because I was working with citrus. My whole station was covered in like oranges and lemons. Um, so Dean was doing Juniper Four Gins. There you see Jen De Mahone from Spain and Russell Henry London Dry Gin. Those are both super Juniper Four Gins. Uh, Rory was doing Savory Gin, so he has a couple barrel aged gins in front of him in this picture. Um, yeah. And then Laura was floral gin. So we, we, we just gave a teaser, I guess, you know, some people who were friends of the business or already knew we were going to be a thing or people who just kind of like Tampa socialites, Kurt and David, friends of Rory. Actually, friends yeah, of I met, yeah, I met them there. That was a, that was right. That was the first time. I, yeah, it was actually, it was a great time and, and definitely a, a, an awesome introduction into the, the world of gins and the different flavor profiles. It was just a way we wanted to give people something besides an alphabetized list you know you come into a place and you just see a list of gins that doesn't give you much context so we wanted to try and just contextualize and also show the diversity of gin and show how weird and eccentric and different from itself it could be well and i certainly i got introduced to a few uh a few gins that i haven't tried uh, before during that time yeah all of us did so, uh, cool. What I want to do next is, um, you know, explore a little bit more into that gin matrix. Okay. And this is a beautiful part about working outdoors is the beautiful sunshine. The, the, the nature. The nature. Sounds, <laughs> nature. Yeah, sounds like a jungle by my house. Hey, that's a good thing. Cool. So, next, uh, or what we've got here is a little bit of the updated gin matrix. There's a few more options. Uh, you said there is like up to 55 that you had 
And it, it was a fluid thing. So, you know, we would lose distribution on something or it would stop being produced. But then at the same time, like last year when Hendrix, Hendrix put out two special release gins last year and we picked them up, we picked up both of them. So, you know, there was some that I right. didn't have, but then there was a few off of Matrix that we would have. But I mean, yeah, give or take, always between 50 and 60. Um, 55 is like a nice round number, but you know, it yeah. would have been flow. Well, and, and take me through uh, parts of this. You mentioned Hendrix, which we actually got right here. Now, mm -hmm. that looks like it's, uh, with this gin matrix, uh, you know, from what I understand it, it just gives you a good idea of where the flavor profiles are going to land for each of the gin. I mean, what, you know, walk me through kind of how it's set up, and then, you know, we'll talk about, like, Hendrix, for, exa for example. Okay. Um, if you want to zoom out and, like, show the whole matrix for a second, the original matrix, all the, all the border botanicals you see, were mm -hmm. labeled they were labeled ah uh, okay but it turned into people treating it like a grid which this is not so it, people would point to juniper up at the top and you know birds of paradise on the side and treat it like it was a grid and kind of like point at the intersection and say so this must taste like these things and we yeah. would say no you know these botanicals you know the botanicals above juniper are all things that lend towards juniper forward gin the botanicals under citrus are all things that have citrus notes like Ginger isn't citrus, but it smells citrusy, right? So you can see ginger root down there under citrus. Um, so in the second, right, in the second revision of the matrix, we removed those words just so that the visual appeal of the botanical stayed, but to try and remove that confusion. Um, and gotcha. then we always said that the closer a gin was to the middle of the matrix, the more balanced it was. You know, those things you see there, those are kind of all known for being balanced gins. They're also known for being good cocktail gins for that purpose. They're versatile. It's a great martini and it's a great gimlet, two drinks that are like vastly different from each other. Um, right. And then so the more something is to a side, the more, you know, the closer it is to a border, the more extreme that flavor profile is, especially considering that thing. So like Hendrix set the bar for floral. And the floral, and then you see that botanica there, not a good example, you know, botanica, mm -hmm. botanicals, right. uh, taking those those flavors. Um, yeah, and St. George, I know they have a couple different varieties, uh, and you see the botanivore there. Mm -hmm. We We've have three St. George yeah. gins on this matrix, I believe. Yeah, that's right, because they have the botanivore. Let me see if I can find the other ones. I know there's a ter the terroir is out there somewhere, right? <laughs> yeah, that's on the right side. It's uh, we're oh, looking nice. at it right now. So a little and savory, good juniper yeah. and citrus in there. Yeah. Cool. And then where's the other one hiding? Um, let's see, Botanivor. What does that leave? Reposado rye. That would be savory as well. That should be on the right side. Yeah. yeah just oh, rye. sorry, just right by it. No, I, I missed it as well. <laughs> <laughs> so literally right by each other that's one of my um, favorite that's one of my favorite gins that gins is outstanding well and yeah actually here's one of my uh you know, over in the citrus and the floral uh one of my secret favorites monkey 47 mm -hmm. um i i don't know i fell in love with that just because partially the story uh to the touch of lingon berry i'm a sucker for um yeah. but uh yeah do you know much about that guy i i do it took a long time for me to find out some about monkey 47 <laughs> monkey 47 hit the scene and it was kind of it was like it was roguish so it was only sold in 375 like 375 milliliter bottles which are really small right. yeah and it, it was like 50 bucks for a bottle of that so you're essentially paying a hundred dollars for a bottle of gin which isn't something <laughs> the clientele that drink gin was ready for i guess at the time but yeah it was so good that people just started paying for it and they started calling for it and then um, in the middle of our time being open, uh, Monkey 47 was purchased by Pernod Ricard, so it's the second biggest spirits company in the world. And yeah. uh, Pernod Ricard just kind of cleaned up. They didn't change anything about the product, but they just kind of cleaned up the uh, supply line and made it a, a little more affordable. So now Monkey 47 is sold in, uh, in liter bottles and a lot more affordable. But uh, specifically to the taste, Monkey 47 was interesting because we would hotly debate whether monkey 47 was floral or was it citrusy or you know what was it and if you i still believe this to this day if you sit with like a glass of monkey 47 for an hour the way it tastes to you will change a few times um 
it was one of the only gens we like Oof. unanimously rated so when we were making the matrix dean rory myself and laura would score these gins blind and uh we would score like we would score their taste quality so how juniper ford is this how citrus ford is this and then we would also just give them an overall score um monkey 47 was one of the only unanimous five stars we had or we we wow. all we we scored it blind we all scored it anonymously of each other and we all scored it perfect um but we couldn't we couldn't agree on if it was floral or not because like the beginning of it would taste a certain way and the end of it would taste another way we decided on floral but um just let it be a talking point that we think it's very complex and interesting um yeah the history of that gin i know a little bit about but there's so much information on their website if you can link that at some point in the show notes or whatever yeah. uh, they're they do such a good job of educating through their website because they know they have a weird product and uh so they they give a ton of information on their website and i could tell you a little bit but i think it, everyone would just be better served if they have the time to just go through Monkey yeah to check website. it out i i will say there's one little thing i know about it that's not widely known um so after the gin comes off the still, which is usually the last step before bottling for you know literally every other gin company in the world, um, they age in uh, concrete tanks, like huge concrete tanks for 90 days, um, which you know isn't doing them any favors. And it was just another thing that let me know I respect people that take the hard way of something because it means it's better. Um, and yeah. you know, adding adding 90 days to your your rotation of bottling and supplying isn't anything that's going to help you, but they still did it because they believed in the flavor and they believed in what it did to the gin. So I can't speak to like exactly how that changes the gin because I haven't had it fresh off the still and after it's aged, but I do believe some of the complexity comes from that like slow oxidation. And, you know, we've all made some, we've all made something that tastes better after it's been in a night in the fridge. And that's kind yeah. of how I described monkey 47, you know, like, monkey 47 spent 90 days in the fridge and it just came out more delicious than it already was yeah something about a, a little age a little mellowing even in the concrete and letting those flavors sit and sit together and and really marry nicely to create yeah something else yeah um no and i love the some of the backstory that i love and i'll be sure that's great uh to link their uh, website so more people can uh, jump down that rabbit hole yeah. Um, but what I loved about it is, you know, the 47 ingredients, you know, coming from the Schwarzwald of Germany. And yeah. apparently uh, at some point, you know, there were legit monkeys involved living out there <laughs> in the woods. <laughs> yeah, that part of the story is uh, that's why you need to go to the website. because I don't want to mess up the details of that. And it's funny. Yeah, we'll leave it. Uh, we'll leave it all for them there. <laughs> Um, nice. So, yeah, that's definitely one of uh, one of a go to gin uh, for anybody out there if they haven't tried it. Uh, and yeah, I do remember it just being in the wee little bottles. It's great to hear that uh, that they're offering the different sizes for everybody. Um, what are some of uh, like your other favorite gins or, or things to note on the, on um, the Matrix here, perhaps? In the top right there, you see Ransom Old Tom. There's a lot of cool stuff in this top right corner. I'll talk about a few. So, uh, cool. Ransom Old Tom there is uh, that I tried the first mm -hmm. day, the first official day I was working on this, like after I was hired, after I interviewed. And that's one of those light bulb moments for me where I just realized gin is not just, you know, my grandfather's beef eater, you know, like. The yeah. legality of the the legality of gin makes it very easy to make your end product different from what's you know considered popular. So the only legal rule surrounding gin in America that has to be bottled at forty percent alcohol and distilled with the essence of juniper, and that doesn't even have to be raw juniper. You can do something like put juniper extract in your end result and call it gin. So you can do whatever else you want. You can put whatever else in there that's safe to drink. You can age it in whatever you want. You can start with any raw material. You can, you know, if you go back to that, uh, that little picture there, Gracias a Dios, which is to the bottom and left of Ransom, uh, mm -hmm. that's a mez that's a mezcal based gin. So they took mezcal and then redistilled it with wow. botanicals. And once you do that, you can call that gin. Um, Cold River, <laughs> Cold River gin in the same shot is made with potatoes. Yeah. Williams GB Dry is made with potatoes. Churigar gin de Mejon in the top there is uh, distilled from brandy 
because they it's in it's made in the island of Menorca right off the coast of Spain and the only sugar source they had there was grapes. So they would make wine, distill it, and then redistill it with juniper. That's kind of how you get this like insanely diverse yeah. th- group of things that are all technically the same thing but have very different flavor profiles. Very different flavors, yeah. And and going back, that's a great point <clears throat> that you made as far as, you know, it's it's not your grandpa's gin anymore you know there's there's yeah. so many different flavors uh, that it, it, people are going to really find something for their own you know i think like the citrus gins the citrus forward ones are those are always uh a, in my opinion those are a popular uh gin to help people get into it you know like from vodka because if you're a vodka sure. lover chances are you like you know you, you're not opposed to a, a flavored or some sort of uh, essence of flavor with the vodka there so that's a neat little gin. Uh, what might be, you know, what would you suggest for someone first getting into gin? Uh, like where where might be a good place to start for them? Um, I agree with you about citrus. I also think like citrus gins and citrus gin and tonics always did well for us because we're in Florida. So aside mm-hmm. from them being easy to get into, it's just you're drinking something that's like really cold and light and refreshing that everyone, whether they like it or not, can kind of agree is good for Florida weather most of the time um i would say malfi lemon was probably my most reached for bottle i would say yeah. that's probably what i reached for most to get people into the category but i the point of the diversity of gin and the diversity of the matrix allowed us to find access points so if someone said yeah. they're not a drinker or they don't like gin or they're a vodka drinker i would reach for malfi but uh, you know, we'd also get a ton of people saying, Hey, I'm a whiskey drinker and I don't drink gin, but I have to try it here. So for them, yeah, I would go, to, go there to the right. Uh, there's a bunch of barrel aged gins, you know, towards the right of the matrix. Ransom Old Tom is one of them. Uh, St. George Reposado, Reposado Rye, which we mentioned is barrel aged. Um, yeah. number 209 barrel reserve there is barrel aged. So, and, uh, Ransom Old Tom actually, the base of that is pot distilled corn and barley. So you're you're starting with essentially a blended whiskey distilling it with botanicals and aging it you're really blurring the lines between whiskey and gin so all that to say i would just try to meet someone where they were like if they drank agave i would start with that mezcal based gin if they drank you know what what do you like as a frame of reference for outside of the world of gin and we probably have something that bridges the gap for you specifically and uh, that was one of my favorite things the matrix allowed for absolutely yeah, well, and we hit on a lot of the different ones. Sounds like vodka. We got the uh, uh, obviously, you know, tequila, or uh, we got the, the gateway gin, uh, whiskey. What about if you're a rum lover? Uh, what would be uh, your suggestion there? Well, you mentioned Monkey Forty Seven earlier. That that base is uh, distilled from sugar beets, so sugar beet molasses. Ah. Um, and at the time, that's the only product like that i knew of i'm trying to think if we found a second one i feel like i feel like we eventually found a, a second molasses based gin but for a very long time it was just monkey 47 and i believe that is a big part of why that gin tastes so interesting as well you have this very like yeah you know if anyone's drank molasses based from most of rum is molasses based if anyone's drank like a a full flavored molasses based rum something that's not over distilled or highly watered down that that has a distinct body and flavor to it and i think that contributes to uh why monkey 47 was just so unique it had a really deep base that it was building on top of i'm gonna try and i'm gonna try and remember another molasses base i swear i found a second one but i can't think of it right now i know that florida cane distillery and ebor they use sugar as the base of all their distillate except for the whiskeys um all their vodkas are cane based um I t- their gin. That's who it was. Their gin. Their Tamiami is molasses based. So uh, okay, cool. That's that's where nice. I was going. So good local, uh, interesting local gin. Product. Yeah, uh, tangerine, yeah. cucumber, juniper, and coriander. Four ingredients. Super delicious. Awesome. Nice. We'll try to get a link uh, to their site as well. Uh, you know, especially at this time, everything helps. So um, absolutely. Pat yeah, and Matt, if yeah. you're watching, hello. Those are great guys. <laughs> Pat and Matt, nice. Pat, yeah, that's one of the owners, and Matt is the kind of like the local man on the boots on the ground for them. Awesome, awesome. Well, no, I appreciate the shout out. We'll uh, be sure to uh, get them linked in, in the video as well. 
Cool. So yeah, on the uh, uh, I was gonna say on the Gin Matrix end, looks like we've got uh, that nicely covered. Um, you know, and especially I appreciate the recommendations on perhaps like you know uh, if if people aren't the gins, you know, ways to to get into it. Now, you know, I, I would just encourage people to get out of their comfort zone whenever you're dealing with cocktails and alcohol. Like it's, I understand looking at a list like this and thinking i don't want to make a decision i've been there thousands of times in my life but i hope that you find yourself near a hospitality professional that kind of has the time and knowledge to uh kind of take you on your own journey and hopefully you can you know if you are feeling so inclined put some of your trust in them and let them walk you into something that uh you didn't know you'll end up loving now one of the big things about sterling barrels is we are all about the cocktails here uh, and making some cocktails. And I know uh, going back, one of the things you mentioned is, you know, in the middle of the matrix, there's definitely some good uh, gins for cocktails. And, you know, the, perhaps, you know, the more balanced uh, a gin is, the perhaps the easier it is to play with cocktails or it just makes for good ones. Mm-hmm. Um, would you agree with that or? Uh, I spe- especially for a fundamental base, you know, like it's, okay. it's hard yeah. to have any hard and fast rules, but yeah, I would agree with that. Cool. Especially for well, classic cocktails too. Right. Well, in, in, yeah, for everybody at home, you know, it's a good place to start and you're not going to go wrong with getting something like that. It's going to play well in, in different cocktails. You mentioned a couple, you know, this classic martini. Uh, there's the, the gimlet uh, you also mentioned as well with the uh, little martini with a lime in there. What's uh, some of your other favorite uh, gin cocktails? Uh, I love Corpse Survivors. I've always loved Corpse Survivors. Corpse mm-hmm. Survivor number two specifically. That's a drink. I've made that drink for a lot of people who told me they hated gin or they told me they wouldn't drink gin and I just lied to them and said it wasn't gin. <laughs> uh, and it's I've literally never had that drink since back in my life. That's like one of those drinks that just always works. Um, yeah. For just uh, for the kids at home who might not know, what goes into the uh, Corp Survivor number two? Uh, so it's an equal parts drink, which is why I like recommending it in situations like this because it's easy to make at home. If you have these ingredients or anything similar to them, you just combine them in equal pe- equal parts. It makes a great single cocktail as well as like a batch or punch bowl. Um, but it's um, a dry gin, Cointreau, or comparable uh, orange liqueur, lemon juice, and uh, either Lole Blanc or Coqui Americano. Both of those are like light aromatized wines that have a, a slight bitter backbone and a lot of citrus notes in them. And they're infused with citrus and spices and then fortified with alcohol so that they're shelf stable. Um, and then nice. you shake those things up in equal proportion and then you either rinse your glass with absinthe or you know if you have an atomizer of absinthe, you know, spray that over your glass. Um, yeah. Another one of those Florida time drinks. Yeah, uh, well, and that's a great tip uh, for the uh, absinthe, like a little bit of little spray bottle uh, or an, the atomizer, if you will. Uh, put They're all over Publix. You can you can get them at Publix. The little Mixto brand. A lot of people have them for olive oil already. Just get a second one and put absinthe in it. You'll absinthe's good in small doses in most cocktails. That's it's like a secret. Exactly. It's like adding salt for a chef. Absinthe. <laughs> One of those it is, yeah, yeah. It's one of those seasons that you need, and and there's a few uh, classic cocktails that call for the absence too. Yeah, sure. Um, so, Corp Survivor, that's always a great one. Uh, what's another uh, favorite or go-to gin cocktail for you? Um, I like taking Negronis and then just making them long. So, like uh, a Negroni with soda, or I've always wanted to work at a place where we could like carbonate our own. Uh, Nice. Uh, when the hall on Franklin first opened, they did a Negroni slushy that was killer. Um, I've seen people take Negronis and like add egg white and make them a fizz. Wow, wow. Negroni creativity! I like I like bitter stuff. I like stuff that lets me keep drinking. Like bitter things <laughs> make for like a nice easy night. They're easy on your stomach and they're usually a little lower alcohol. Yeah, uh, anything yeah. anything with a bitter twist. Yeah, and uh, for if the Negroni classic cocktail, another equal parts with the uh, gin, sweet vermouth, and Campari. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, personal favorite on the sweet vermouth, what's your go-to? Um, I've always been a huge uh, Torino vermouth fan, so Italian sweet vermouth. Nice. Um, Co- Koki was like... Koki was what I thought was most delicious and let the drinks be affordable as well. There's some vermouths out there that are delicious 
are very bold and make big great Negronis, but they also make twenty dollar Negronis. So uh, <laughs> yeah, Koki Torino was kind of like my sweet spot for you know deliciousness and uh, accessibility. Another popular one, the Carpano, I see is yeah. uh, is pretty popular. Um, you know, if you're looking for something a little bit above, I think the I think those are two great recommendations. For sure. And if is, is Sterling Barrels like Tampa specific? No, we're uh, we're looking to reach out, uh, you know, uh, nationwide. I'm just going to recommend know, some places people. that I know have good vermouth. Uh, like well, no, for definitely really for don't carry it, but yeah, no, definitely. Uh, the, the, no, if you have some good recommendations, um, and Tampa Jug and Bottle in Seminole Heights has always carried carried the Koki line, and it's not expensive. They're like twelve dollars a bottle, and all of their i mentioned cookie americano and the corp survivor that's their like lighter style and then the torinos or sweet vermouth both of those are i mean i would drink those on their own with like that's what i take to the beach i take vermouth to the beach but anyway <laughs> um anywhere you can find the cookie line is a trusted brand anything anything that says vermouth de chambery which is a french word it means like that type of vermouth is protected and monitored by the government so uh, you know that it's quality and yeah. And how about uh, how about a third favorite to to close out on the the cocktail in? I'll be gin and tonic, but that's too boring of an answer. I can't say that. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh. This is a weird one, but I'll I'll say it because I like it and it's a good cocktail uh, format. Like this works when you substitute a lot of things too. There's a drink called oh, a Bijou great. that is uh, it's in the Negroni family, but it's equal parts. Um, Sweet vermouth, green chartreuse, and gin, all very like assertive, weird flavors. Um, and it works, it's, it's a fun drink to mess around with. Uh, you know, you can just substitute mezcal instead of gin or use gin in mezcal. It's a, yeah. it's a little more off the beaten path one, like the, the drinking public may not have heard of it, but it's a, like a cocktail nerd porter. Yeah. That is delicious. <laughs> Uh, green chartreuse yeah chartreuse definitely uh oh, man good ingredient there fun fact actually the uh green chartreuse the color was named after the uh beverage so absolutely yeah um now i want to uh we mentioned some of the classic cocktails first and i want to get in uh, just touch on this a uh, little bit uh, because of the martini uh martini was born in the jim family actually we're yeah, the martini uh, originally was uh, equal parts, uh, with, but then it's morphed uh, over time. Yeah. Uh, you know, what what is your take on the uh, the martini at this point? Um, I just hope that it. I hope we can get to a point where, like, you had this you had this weird phase in American restaurant experiences where, like, we're com- coming off of prohibition, we're fighting wars for thirty years. And then we get to the 70s and 80s where people like different drugs and alcohol and American dining and drinking culture just goes through a weird phase. Like the rest of the world, the rest of the eating and drinking world never went through that like dark age that we did, especially in relation to the prohibition. So you have a lot of weird things we deal with today because of that. And one of them is like, Someone will come in and say, can I get a cherry martini? And like, I know what they mean when they ask that, but I would like to get to a point where when someone's using the martini as a word, like to order they want, like the classic, just because the thing that you got at Fridays for the past 20 years was delicious, but not a martini. You know, like we just, you need to be able to like differentiate. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, again, I'm not here to like correct anyone and I would never do that at the bar. I just... I hope that the public gets to the point where when like a martini is spoken about, they know they're getting a stiff, stirred vodka or gin drink that doesn't have a lot else in it. Um, I love a good martini, but you can't. I'm not the guy that like goes to the bar and slams four and like Uber's home. I don't know. I don't like those. Those are just <laughs> yeah. too. I don't like to drink that many stiff drinks consecutively. Um, but I love good martinis and good martini twists. Um, I don't like dirty martinis. I've never yep. understood drinking salty drinks. I think that's weird. That's just a personal thing. No, especially with gin. It's like, first of all, you want to taste the gin. They're not familiar with the martini. Again, you know, it's uh, it, there's the stirred or shaken question. Uh, there's how much vermouth you're supposed to put in it uh, to the fact now that, you know, it's barely a whisper, if at all. 
depending on the, the type of spirit. Important to drink it how you like it, uh, sure. but understand, I think, the, the why. You know, part of the science behind it, you know, if you shake the martini, it's going to dilute it. Uh, if you stir it, it feel, chills it down, pre preserves the, uh, you know, the taste of the original spirit a little bit more. And I would tell the staff that so. too, like the important part, the important part of our, the only thing that's true about every martini is that everyone drinks theirs differently. So make sure that when someone orders that, you don't just stop with martini, like get more specific with them, make sure they want gin or vodka. Don't just assume. Uh, that's one of those drinks where like, when you take that order down, it might have four or five lines. You know, everyone has the exact amount of olives they yep. want. They might want a twist as well. You know, that's one of those, there's no, I would say there's no consensus martini. Uh, so just make it as best as you can based on what the person you're making it for says they want. Now, uh, cool. What I'd like to do is jump to a little bit of the you know, gin history. Uh, and uh, what this is, is I'm actually sharing uh, from a great little book, uh, which I've come to love. It's called Alcoholica Esoterica. It's a great book. It tells a lot of history of, you know, spirits and cocktails uh, and kind of the whole spirit world. And, you know, a chapter dedicated to each of uh, uh, each of the different ingredients. This one all about gin, you know, gin uh, from the gutter to the upper class. Uh, <laughs> You know, starting off in, in Europe, uh, in a big part of the, the Dutch history and, uh, you know, in Holland being behind uh, the first making of gin. Uh, and part of it was during the fun facts. And well, here we go. It's the Black Plague Berry. So during the Black Plague, they would actually wear masks of juniper, uh, which were thought to help, uh, you know, avoid uh, plague and help keep healthy or whatever was being was being sold at that time. Um, but that's where I think the love of juniper and the ingredient uh, became uh, came into play. I would take uh, a juniper mask right now if they had one. Like, that would I know, work. right? That would be yeah. I'm, we're not rec recommending gin soaked uh, masks. No, Actually, don't do that. Don't do that. That's a terrible idea. <laughs> so uh, you know, gin uh, for the Netherlands, you know, got into the king's court, all this good stuff. So you know, it, it was introduced to royalty. But then the Brits got hold of it, apparently. Basically, what's happening is the English were so used to drinking beer, uh, but then beer became too expensive. Uh, and then they started producing gin and lots of gin. Now, the problem is, is that uh, people started drinking gin like they drank beer. And if you know anything yes. about uh, spirits and percentages, that's not necessarily a good idea. Not if you want to live. No. No. So they're talking about gin palette. You've got black market versus the large distillers now, because you know you got the black market gut rot, and then you got the. This is the time in the early 1800s where some of the large scale gin distillers you might recognize Gordon, Beef Eaters, Tangare. Uh, that's when they started in business. So you got these gin barons coming into power. It starts becoming from the gutter when these gin barons start to taking it, and then it starts moving into the upper class. And uh, here's, I want to go on a little tangent because British soldiers uh, are all about uh, the gin. Uh, and here's where this cocktail came into play. In India, they were required to drink a daily dose of tonic water with quinine to combat malaria. Now, yeah. gin, they discovered, nullified the bitter tonic taste. Lo and behold, you're one of your favorites, the gin and tonic is born during this time. A, so, lot of uh, those, a lot of those yeah. were like born out of necessity way before they were thought about as delicious. It's funny how that's worked out. but Yeah, especially with quinine being that, you know, uh, when you think tonic water, that quinine is that flavor you you're, you typically think of. Kind of like juniper yeah. is a very popular gin flavor. For sure. So then we get to America in the Prohibition time. Put it, uh, gin went through finishing school during American Prohibition. Uh, so black market, you got the, the raw tub, bathtub gin, where I think uh, gin got such a bad rap in America for such a long time. Uh, but then finally, uh, to get the right stuff, you wanted the London dry gin, uh, because the American, uh, you know, the swill, uh, if you will, was usually sweetened. So uh, those would always taste sweeter. You wanted the London dry gin, uh, that were the, that's where that kind of term was born. Uh, for the real uh, gin, if you knew it was that nice London dry, you knew it was uh, better for you. But also the price of it definitely goes up. And uh, 
little useless info. Uh, Rip Van Winkle, apparently that story. He's naturally a thirsty soul and falls asleep after he had too much of the flavor of excellent Hollands, also known as gin. <laughs> yep. That, that's uh, interesting. Yeah. Well, and I know I was kind of scrolling that through. What what I totally will do is include a link to the Alcoholica Esoterica for everybody so they can uh, check that out. It's definitely a fun book. It looks um, great. I don't own this, and I thought I owned every book on Jen there was, but this is this is super interesting. I'm going to order this right now as well, soon as we're done. There we go. It'll give everybody okay, a little cool. idea what to look out for. Uh, and we'll definitely include that in the link for everybody. Um, and one of the last things I wanted to uh, hit on is... Uh, is they had brought it up as far as like the sailors and gin and one last little fun fact for everybody before we head out is um navy strength gin i love this uh what do you know about the navy strength or can you share a little bit about the story of like navy strength style yeah so uh you mentioned a little bit about people drinking gin to excess and drinking gin in like beer quantities um part of the british royal navy's compensation package to their military the navy military was alcohol so you were rationed if you were basically if you weren't a captain you drank rum and you were rationed rum a pint a day so think about the last time you drank 16 sub ounces of rum a day and then do that every day um and <laughs> captains were rationed the same amount but they the captains drank gin so you mentioned how gin came to be something that wasn't peasant drinks anymore it was like high society um rum was considered the poor people's drink and so that's why the lower ranks of the military drank that but the navy yeah. found out that if the alcohol was 57 percent if the if the alcohol solution was at least 57 percent or higher if it spilled into the gunpowder that was stored on the boats the gunpowder would still light anything lower than that was you, the gunpowder was basically rendered useless after that. So you got you you see this term in gin and rum for that reason, gunpowder proof for navy strength. Yeah. Um, 57% alcohol or higher. And some classic cocktails call for, you know, specific renditions of either of those. That's that's what I know of that. Yeah, they had to uh, make sure that gin was at a high enough temp or high enough proof to still be explosive for if and when it uh, spilled or combined with the gunpowder and the gin was stored with the gunpowder because it was always left in uh, lock or kept up under lock and key away from yeah. the general public and the, <laughs> all the sailors there. Very um, important. Very yeah, important security indeed. measures. <laughs> it really was. So uh, I want to say thank you again uh, to Daniel Beresfold for joining us, our spirits expert and uh, spirits professional. My pleasure. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, it was definitely a fun gin chat. Happy belated uh, International Gin and Tonic Day to you, sir. Yeah, I'll drink one today in, uh, in honor of this conversation and everyone should. We will. Actually, uh, we'll uh, get this up for tonight so everybody can enjoy this and hopefully have a little gin cocktail, gin and tonic. So I hope all of you out there uh, enjoy your cocktails. Cheers for when you do and have a great Cheers. day, everybody. Cheers. Thanks, Eric. Good to talk to you. Thank you. You too.